Well, we're delighted at this special edition of This Week in Virginia to have two senators on with us. Senator Jennifer Boisco, who represents portions of Fairfax County and parts of Loudoun County, served in the House of Delegates for a couple of terms and now in the first term in the Senate. And Dr. Gazala Hashmi, PhD, who I like to add that in when I can, who represents Powhatan County and parts of Chesterfield in the city of Richmond. And each of you in your first terms, you've um, come a long way to be in the Senate uh, from Alabama and Arkansas and from India. And we're, we're delighted that you're here and thank you for being on the show. My co-host, Angel Miner, has been really interested in, in talking with you all and she's going to begin the show with some of her questions and then I'll jump in and feel free to interact with each other as we as we move along. So Angel, thank you for setting up this show and the show is yours. Thank you. Thank you both for being here too. Um, my first question is what led you both to run for the General Assembly? Uh, well, I can tell you that I, I have been involved in politics and local government for really my whole adult life. And um, watching the General Assembly members um, moving in a direction that I didn't think my community wanted um, was really what inspired me. I helped a lot of other people get elected and I finally said, you know what, I can do this just as well as anybody else. And so I ran for office, um, was not successful the first year I ran, lost by 32 votes. Um, but then came back again two years later, and now this is my sixth year in office. Thanks for the question. And thank you, Angel, for that question. I, I really had two uh, points of impetus for my decision to run for office. I had been working in higher education for close to 30 years, and nearly 20 of those years were spent in the community college at J. Sargent Reynolds Community College, specifically in Richmond. And uh, I, I think there's no better place to see what is actually happening inside of our communities than a community college. We serve the people who are working really hard to uh, get retrained or uh, academic credentials to improve their uh, job and career opportunities, uh, working hard to support their families. And I just saw my students' uh, uh, struggles increasing. Uh, our tuition costs were going up, the cost of uh, textbooks were rising, and very significantly, a lot of my students were struggling with housing and food insecurity. And I just knew that as a state, we needed to do better and we certainly could do better. And so I wanted to be in a position where I could impact policy decisions uh, for the students that I cared about so deeply. Uh, my second impetus came in 2017 with the inauguration of Donald Trump and, and all of the realities of um, what the Trump administration was going to bring to office, particularly against marginalized communities. And uh, as a Muslim American who had lived in this country for nearly 50 years at that point, I knew I had an obligation to speak out and to represent uh, people who are being hurt by the rhetoric and, and the policy actions of that administration. Thank you. Um, Senator Bosco, you introduced a bill expanding financial aid for, elite, for undocumented immigrants for college. Um, what sparked this initiative? I've been working, so I, I represent the 33rd Senate District and previously the 86th House District, which is a very diverse socioeconomic as well as cultural diversity right here. And as you just heard uh, Senator Hashmi talking about working in the community college com um, area, we have seen people being disenfranchised, not being able to get on, um, you know, on their feet. And we know that education is that springboard that helps people move into success. Um, I watched my mother do it. She was a single mom who worked uh, sub minimum wage jobs when I was a little girl. She finally went back to college, became a registered nurse through our community college. And, and then we were okay after that. And I know that not everybody has that option. And so 
for a, a number of years, I worked with uh, Delegate Alfonso Lopez to just get the option for our undocumented students to attend and get in-state tuition. This past year, that was finally successful last year. And this year we followed up on that to help them have access to financial aid because we know that money, you know, these tuition costs are a barrier and our economy is a better for everyone when we have a well-educated workforce who can come and contribute and, uh, you know, be a part of our society and have success. Thank you. Um, I hope not, but was there any pushback when you brought up this bill? <laughs> there was a huge amount of pushback on just getting in-state tuition. In fact, um, Alfonso Lopez and I sat in the former speaker's office asking, could we at least have a, a committee hearing? I think that was 2018, perhaps. Yeah, I think it was in 2018. And he said, no, we're not going to we're not going to have a hearing on it even. The, um, the year that I carried it when I went into the Senate, um, we had one Republican vote for it in the Senate um, Health and Education. Um, and then it was sent to finance where they said there was not a fiscal impact. Then they sent it back to the Health and Education, twisted the arm of the Senator who voted for it on the Republican side and killed the bill. So we've had, it has been a long road and I'm not the first person to carry it. This has been something that decades of, of, of leaders in Virginia have been working on. And it's just really refreshing to see the, uh, the, the changes that elections make um, in the priorities of, of the members. And, and, and we had literally no pushback this year. It was an administration bill. We worked collaboratively with organizations from around the Commonwealth, from the colleges and universities to the activists who will um, help um, you know, get this done. Angel, if you don't mind my adding, um, I actually came into office with this as a priority last year. And this was because of the students that I'd been working with. I'd, as a faculty advisor, I'd had many students who um, came to my office and just broke down in tears because while they could struggle and pay the cost of uh, community college tuition, once they had achieved their two-year degrees, the, the roadblocks uh, in front of them were insurmountable. They simply couldn't afford to go to VCU or to any of our other wonderful state institutions and pay those out-of-state tuition dollars, and their options were very limited. So this was a top priority for me, and I was so thankful that Senator Boisco and uh, Delegate Lopez and others had worked on this bill and that we were able to successfully navigate it through in last year's session. Um, I asked some students when we see how they felt about this bill coming up, and one person asked, why should undocumented Im immigrants be, be able to qualify for in-state tuition? Yeah, so, you know, we were really careful in the way that we wrote it. Um, one, a person has to have gone to school here in Virginia to high school. They have to have a parent or a guardian who has paid taxes in the state, has been contributing to society, been a part of the community. So while they may not be, um, um, you know, their immigration status might be, not be um, documented, they are people who have lived and worked and participated in our system here in Virginia. They're paying sales tax, they are holding jobs, they are part of our community. And I believe that they deserve the chance mm -hmm to uh, get a higher education for the same cost as my kids could do. A lot of times we calculate the, the, the cost of uh, providing financial aid. And we have to remember these are students who are not qualified for federal financial aid and thus have very, very limited options. But, um, you, you know, we have to balance the cost of providing uh, uh, state financial aid with the cost of not educating people. 
not providing them opportunities to become contributing members of our, our communities. And, and the costs are significant. If you look at um, high school dropout rates, because there's little incentive for individuals to continue on to higher education if they see no meaningful pathway for themselves, um, uh, the low paying jobs in which they become trapped. These are significant costs to our economy, to our societies, and actually research shows that providing pathways to education for large parts of our community will open up uh, and, uh, and, and really improve e the economy for everybody. Um, this bill will help a lot of people pay for college. As you said, tuition is really expensive. Could there be other programs in the future to help low-income families pay for tuition as well? Yeah, so Governor Northam has the G3 program, Get Skilled, Get a Job, Give Back, which is focusing on financial aid and uh, tuition assistance for students who are qualified at a socioeconomic level who want to go into certain fields. Um, again, as Senator uh, Hashmi just said, the, the cost of us not educating folks is, is far above and beyond um, detrimental to when we compare to what happens if we if we just leave them without help. That investment that we're making in individuals, especially folks who haven't been able to get um, you know, equal footing, is what's going to move our economy forward. We have a generation of people who are getting ready to retire and to end the, their, their working careers. We do not have enough skilled workers in the United States and in Virginia who are ready to take those 21st century jobs. So it's incumbent upon us to be creative and thoughtful to make sure that we are working to give access and opportunities to all people. And I, I think um, having those options for all Virginians, low-income Virginians, and supporting um, their pathways to education is absolutely critical. And Senator Boisco has mentioned one of our programs, the new G3 program, uh, through community colleges that opens up um, many areas of our workforce development uh, areas that we really need Virginians to go into. That's an important pathway. Um, but as we continue to think about how we prioritize education, you know, when, when this country was founded, it was founded by people who knew the value of education, who knew that uh, universal access to high quality public education was an absolute right for everybody living in this country. I think we have to, in the 21st century, begin to reevaluate that because we know that high school diplomas are not sufficient for the kind of economy, the kind of jobs that we now need to have people ready to, to work in and being able to support individuals so that they can uh, function effectively in a, in a new economy is, is a priority for us. And I think Virginia can lead the way in making sure that access to higher education and to different kinds of credentials uh, is available for the majority of our folks. Um, when does this bill come into effect? And until then, what does that mean? So the bill comes into effect in 2022. So for next school, the school year after this next one, people will be able to um, to to apply. We have some some preparation in uh, that's required um, over the next year. And my last question, you guys both kind of touched on touched on it already, but um, do you think decreasing tuition will cause um, an increase in potential future jobs? And if so, how can we go about that? I, I think we absolutely need to focus on uh, reducing tuition costs for families. And we can do that by pr prioritizing it through the state budget, making sure that our institutions of higher learning are adequately supported and that they have 
uh, the opportunities to do what they need to do. That includes hiring excellent faculty, um, uh, expanding access for a variety of students and continuing to provide the, the curricula that supports our, um, our needs in Virginia. Uh, one step that we've taken also in this past General Assembly it is to all, uh, establish an Office of Labor and Workforce um, uh, Evaluation. And so this particular office will be studying what is coming down the pike in 10 years, 15 years, using sound data and analysis to project the kind of jobs, the kind of careers that we will be seeing in 10 years, 20 years, and also making sure that our institutions uh, have that information so that they can develop the curricula that's needed and hire the, the faculty and the specialists that will be able to provide learning resources for, for students. You know, when I went to school, um, I never anticipated the kind of jobs we see now. <laughs> there was no such thing as a cell phone, for example. So uh, being able to project what new developments are coming towards us and helping Virginians, helping young folks uh, prepare for those jobs is really, really important for us. Yeah, and another thing that we haven't really talked about is um, that a four-year college or a two-year college are not the only opportunities for, for workforce development and for preparing for your professional life. There are labor unions where you can get paid a good wage and go through their training over a four-year period where you will become a master plumber or electrician at the end of it. And the entire time, there's no cost to you and you're making money while you're going through the process. Those are, those are you know, all the different um, skills sets that we need in Virginia. Um, not only are do you have a, you know, a college degree required, but there are other options. And I think it's really important at the high school level that we make sure that students have access to understanding what those options are and have examples so that they can make good decisions for themselves. One of the things that we have saddled our young generation with, and you know, I have children in their, in their mid twenties, is student debt. We are now at the point where it's almost impossible for a student who had to take loans out to buy a house, buy a car, you know, get on their feet. There, we have people who are moving back in with their parents because they are so saddled with student debt that they are literally, um, you know, handcuffed until they can get 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 um, get that on, you know, on board. We need to address that as well. It's bigger than credit card debt in this country. It's an enormous, enormous problem, and I think we're going to have to do something at the federal level. Um, to solve that. And I hope that President, Biden, uh, President Biden will um, look at that seriously. You know, thank you, Angel, and thank you, Senators, for the, for the discussion. I think it's interesting that this comes right on almost on the heels of an executive order by the President that uh, will make the incarcerated eligible for Pell Grants. And again, showing the need for education. And Senator Hashmi, a generation ago, I taught in a community college up in the Shenandoah Valley, and one of my most delightful assignments was going to a work camp in Rockingham County and teaching the inmates in a, in a nighttime course. And later they were able to come on campus at Blue Ridge Community College. And so I think to, to, to realize that the incarcerated are going to be released and need to, to have access to education and even, and even Pell Grants to, to help them in that process. We could probably spend the rest of the time talking just on this issue, but let's move over. And Senator Hashmi, you mentioned one of your other bills. You didn't say it was your bill. It was the one about education and labor market alignment the office created. Um, Senator Boisco, mention another one of your bills that you'd like to, and then also Senator Hashmi as, as well. So what's, what's another bill that you would like to mention? Yeah, so one of the other things that we haven't talked about today, but, but is related is um, broadband access. And, and, and that certainly is a big part of education and um, economic development. I'm the chair of the Broadband Advisory Council. And this year we, we got a, a number of things passed, including major investments, another $50 million towards broadband expansion, but also 
um, working towards implementation to um, make sure that our unserved areas are, are getting access. Another issue has been in affordability of broadband. And so we're now gonna work with our schools and private providers to expand access to the lower, the lower income people to give them special, um, special tools so that they can also um, have access to broadband. Because we know after this year of, of COVID where everybody is remote that Broadband is not just a luxury anymore. It's a, an absolute requirement, just as this meeting is today. So we're really working hard to, to expand access to all corners of Virginia. Senator Hashmi, what's another one of your bills? Uh, you, had, you each had several bills that are before the governor right now waiting for a governor's action. Uh, well, thank you. I'm really excited by the, our food assistance uh, legislation that we passed this year, and I call it the Farm to Food Banks bill because it is a bill designed to uh, respond to our COVID crisis and the situation of uh, hunger that so many Virginians are now facing, but it's also designed to help our agricultural community. I represent Powhatan County, which has a, a very large agricultural population and I know our farmers have been struggling too through this economic crisis. And so this bill gives uh, funding to our charitable food organizations so that they in turn can uh, 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 pay our farmers to harvest and to package and transport produce and other food resources right into our charitable food banks and uh, other organizations. And we can get the Virginia food um, to Virginians who are struggling with uh, hunger during this period. And so I think it's a hugely beneficial bill for so many different communities. And Senator Boisco, among all of your interesting bills, there was one about adoption that I'd like to get you to explain a little bit about that bill. Sure, thank you for asking about it. Um, I, I have focused a lot of my work around um, LGBTQ uh, equality and this specifically, um, allows two adults who have a legitimate interest in a child to equally adopt uh, so that they have the same rights and responsibilities for the child. Um, and not only would it help our LGBTQ families, but also imagine in, in COVID and um, other challenging things where a mother and perhaps the grandmother might equally adopt the child to have the equal co-parenting responsibilities and, and privileges. Um, this is something that is pro-child, pro-family, and is, is going to help um, million, you know, hundreds of families uh, in Virginia. Senator Hashmi, I know healthcare, looking on your websites, and we're going to put those websites up each of yours so people can go and see them, that healthcare is another matter of concern and interest you and your constituents. And you had a couple of bills on healthcare. Uh, tell us about one or both of those. Uh, well, yes, I think uh, my bill on expanding uh, uh, or creating rather the Occupational Therapy License Compact is a very important bill for Virginians. I had been approached by uh, folks from the OT organizations, both state as well as national, and they pointed out the kind of challenges that occupational therapists and occupational therapy assistants often face because uh, many of them actually belong to military families, their spouses of military members, and when their uh, loved ones are relocated across uh, the country, they have to go through a relicensing process every time, and it's a challenge and, and uh, impacts their ability to work efficiently. So this compact is uh, going to be hugely beneficial for large numbers of our OT community. Um, the, Virginia is the first to enter into this compact and we need more states to join it. But once we have uh, the compact in place, Virginia is in a position to actually design the um, kind of parameters and regulations that will govern this compact. So that was a, a, a really critical bill for them. The other bill is uh, for physical therapists. You know, we can see physical therapists as patients for up to 30 days without needing a prescription. 
And now with COVID, we realized we were had uh, patients struggling to try to go see their primary care physician to get uh, a prescription to extend that opportunity to get uh, physical therapy. So now patients can see their uh, therapist for up to 60 days without uh, getting a prescription uh, from their physician to do that. So again, consumer aid and, and um, uh, help for, for our patient communities. Senator Boisco, you served, as we said before, two terms in the House in which you were face to face and not virtual. And I think before we wrap up the show, I'd like for you and Senator Hashmi to talk some about the challenges and how it worked. Uh, I think our viewers know that you met in the Science Museum. Uh, since, since the reconvened day from the previous year, you've been at the Science Museum and they've been seeing you meeting there. So some comments about how the session has gone and uh, we'd love to hear them. The one thing that I think, David, that um, we really um, missed was having the public with us right there in the same room. I know that we had Zoom, but I didn't get to see you at all or Angel through the whole thing. It wasn't in my the front of my mind that you were watching. And I think that that was really lacking. I think that there was um, sometimes uh, a lack of awareness that other people were paying attention to what we were doing. Um, and everybody wasn't on their best behavior. I, I'm being really candid with you about that um, because when we're just in a committee room with 12 other people, we sometimes get a little bit more familiar than we would be if we were sitting on a dais. And while I'm really glad that we were able to meet in person as the legislature, uh, you know, as, as senators, um, and we were able to have conversations, um, we really missed out on having the awareness that we were still with the public, I think. I don't know how you feel, Senator Hashmi, but that yeah, was, I, it was a, a challenge. It, it was a very challenging session. This was my first, uh, I'm sorry, my second session, of course, and my first one was challenging to begin with. And then uh, with the uh, second session being in a virtual uh, in a split environment in the way that we had, there were some challenges. But I want to say um, uh, uh, how wonderful the Science Museum of Virginia was in hosting the, the Virginia Senate. They did a tremendous job and they are part of my district. So I was very proud of uh, being able to host uh, the, the Senate in that uh, facility. Um, in addition to the kind of challenges that Senator Boisco has uh, shared, I think, um, you know, I think some of our legislation, frankly, suffered as a result of not being able to have that kind of collaboration and communication with the House members in the direct manner that we are accustomed to. Uh, for instance, I had a bill on environmental justice and and uh, it was, there was a companion bill on the House side. We had um, just a very short period of time to uh, work together on the conference report. And because of the challenges of working virtually, uh, I, I think we missed an opportunity. We weren't able to reach an agreement. Whereas if we were face-to-face -face and in a room together, I'm pretty sure we would have been able to resolve some of the concerns that we had. Um, so I'm hoping that next year our session will be, our General Assembly will be back at the Capitol and we will be with all of our colleagues. Uh, that is always helpful. Yeah. Yeah, that was a real challenge. And the fact that the public wasn't able, I mean, some of the, some of the meetings, someone would have 30 seconds to, to share their concerns about something. And the fact that we weren't really able to work with our house colleagues on a daily basis or sit down at a table together because we were, they were all spread out on the, the Commonwealth. It was a real challenge, um, but we did it and we got some really amazing, um, important and, uh, transformative legislation passed. So I do think it was a success and I am really proud of the work that we were able to accomplish. It's a good note to end on the success of the session and the hopes that the 2022 session will be back the way it was pre-COVID and you'll be back April the 7th for the reconvene day. And we thank you very much, each of you, for being on This Week in Virginia. We thank 
Angel for arranging the show and for beginning the first portion of it. So thank you, and we look forward. We will be seeing you on April 7th when you're here. Thank you. Thank you.